Hey guys, I'm Heidi Preeb. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome if this is your first time here. Today we are going to be talking about the fearful avoidant attachment style and why this style can have a particular level of difficulty when it comes to moving on from or gaining closure around past romantic relationships. Now, all attachment styles are going to have their own unique challenges when it comes to that moving on and closure gaining process. But today we're gonna really hone in on what it is for the fearful avoidant style that can make it so difficult to find that closure and feel comfortable and settled moving into the next stage of their relationship life. So we're gonna go over five specific difficulties that fearful avoidants tend to experience in this department. And then we're also gonna briefly go over some of the antidotes or some of the possible routes out of those difficult thought and behavior patterns. So without any further ado, we will get right into reason number one. The first reason why those with fearful avoidant attachment styles tend to struggle when it comes to moving on from romantic relationships is because they do not experience intimacy easily or regularly. So to have a fearful avoidant attachment style means that generally you have a deep connection to your own emotional experience and just in general your self-concept. However, you can really struggle with opening up and showing those more vulnerable parts of yourself to other people. Now, this is distinct from those who are, let's say, more dismissive avoidant, who don't necessarily have that same strong emotional self-connection, right? They tend to be very tuned into their own thoughts and actions and goals, but there's not always that same sense of this is who I am on a very deep felt level. And those using anxious attachment strategies do tend to have a strong sense of their emotional experience. However, they don't necessarily experience the same difficulty that fearful avoidance have when it comes to sharing their emotional experience. Because they have that you're okay worldview, they tend to believe that other people are capable of understanding them emotionally, and so they're more likely to share themselves with others and form close relationships with others more regularly. Now, with the fearful avoidant, you have that connection to the self and often you have someone who has very deeply analyzed and gotten to know themselves, and yet because the fearful avoidant has the I'm not okay, but also you're not okay worldview, they tend to share the dismissive avoidance belief that other people are probably on average not either smart enough or caring enough or capable of, in some capacity, understanding them. So they're gonna be very slow to open up to partners in a real intimate way. Fearful avoidance can be very warm on the surface, and they might even seem as though they're speaking at length about their emotions. But if you're really paying attention in the initial stages, fearful avoidance are generally not sharing the really vulnerable stuff. They're sharing the stuff that they've already kind of processed and found a way to contain. To get to that really vulnerable stuff with a partner, it takes a very long time for most people with a fearful avoidant attachment style. So when they finally get to that place and open up to a person, if they then lose that person, it can feel like a tremendous loss because they don't have that many people who they have ever shown themselves to that deeply. And they're likely to know, either consciously or unconsciously, that it's going to take them a very long time to get to that place again with somebody else. So you might have this desire with the fearful avoidant to cling to a relationship even after you know it's gone bad, simply because you feel as though you won't find that sense of intimacy and understanding anywhere else. Or even if you do, it's gonna take you like five years. And the process of opening up and letting someone see your vulnerabilities and get to know you in that way is something that you generally find pretty uncomfortable and pretty daunting. And so losing a romantic partner who you have opened yourself up to and truly been vulnerable with is kind of a triple whammy of processing the loss, having nowhere else to turn if you don't have any friends or family members who you have true, deep, vulnerable connections with, and having to experience the dread of knowing that you're gonna have to do it all over again if it's a process that you really loathe. So the first reason why fearful avoidance can struggle to move on from romantic relationships is because a lot of them don't really open up to anyone until they get really deep into a romantic partnership, and then there is a lot resting on that partnership if that's the person they're going to with most of their more vulnerable needs. They're losing a lot when they're losing a relationship like that. 
as opposed to, let's say, a securely attached person who might have a very deep and intimate connection with their partner, but who probably also has deep, emotionally intimate connections with their friends or their family members, and who have a wide network of support that they can turn to when things are not going well in their partnership. So while it would still count as a humongous loss for a secure person to lose their partner, it would not be the loss of their only resource when it comes to true, deep, vulnerable, intimate connection. Reason number two why those with fearful avoidant attachment styles can really struggle to move on from romantic relationships is because, and in my opinion, this is the most overlooked one, fearful avoidance are probably more likely than any other attachment style to leave a relationship while they are still in love with the person. Why would this happen? A core part of the fearful style is that sense of enmeshment and not knowing how or when or where to draw boundaries in relationships. So when you have someone with a fearful avoidance style, there is a very high likelihood that when something happens in the relationship that they don't like, they're not necessarily going to be aware of it in the moment and able to set the appropriate boundaries. They are more likely to get disoriented, not know what it's fair to ask for, which boundaries it's fair to set. They might start an impulsive fight over something and then the next day decide, oh my God, I made a huge mistake. Actually, the whole problem was me and then go fawn and take complete responsibility. There is a large pervasive sense of disorientation within this style about what boundaries it's okay to have and what it's okay to ask for in a relationship. So this disorientation, while it is absolutely not intentional and not something anyone would choose, does tend to lead to quite a bit of conflict that doesn't necessarily get resolved in a way that prevents it from happening again. It's also worth noting that fearful avoidance do not tend to date secure people, they tend to date other insecurely attached people. So it's likely that in these relationships, there's a lot of unintentional conflict and chaos that isn't necessarily getting resolved. And eventually this might reach a breaking point where either the person with the fearful avoidant attachment style or their partner kind of throws up their hands and goes, that's it, I'm out. I cannot take this anymore, it's too stressful, it's too chaotic, I need to get out, even if I still have a lot of love for the person I am with. And I think this is something that fearful avoidance tend to not acknowledge enough and give themselves enough emotional credit for. The fact that they are not just going back and forth because they can't make up their minds, a lot of the time it's because they leave while they are still in love. Contrast this with someone who has a more secure style. They are likely to deal with small conflicts as they come up, set boundaries wherever it's appropriate to, and so if they are choosing to leave a relationship, it's probably because their feelings have genuinely changed. Ergo, we have all these norms around people leaving relationships when they no longer have feelings. So then if you have a fearful style, you leave a relationship and you still have feelings for the person, you're probably gonna feel like, what is wrong with me? Like, why is it so much easier for other people to move on when I am still stuck missing this person who I wanted to break up with? Well, chances are it's easier for a lot of other people to move on because they were probably already on the way to falling out of love, if not mostly fallen out of love, when they left the relationship. And for you, that might not be the case most of the time because you have these additional challenges to deal with by virtue of your attachment system. And that might just be something to give yourself some grace around, right? If you took a secure person out of the middle of a relationship while they were very in love and very connected to their partner, they would also experience distress and regret and a desire to reach out and get back in touch with that person. Those are normal feelings to have when you are in love with someone. It's just very unfortunate and very difficult when you're tasked with leaving a relationship while the love is still there because the level of dysfunction is so high. And this is something you might wanna consider lending yourself a lot of compassion around. Reason number three why those with fearful avoidant attachment styles tend to struggle to move on from romantic relationships is because the point at which they are likely to exit a relationship is a point at which they are deactivated. So when you are fearful avoidant, you have two different types of attachment responses that come online for you in different situations. One is the hyperactivated response that is characteristic of the anxious attachment style. 
So when your attachment system is hyper activated, you are scanning for threats, you are focused on your partner's behavior, you are trying to increase your proximity to them, detect any deception that might be happening, and generally make sure that you are staying close to that person. When your attachment system is deactivated, you are experiencing a conscious disconnect from the emotions that are relevant to your attachment relationships. So if you are angry, if you are upset, you might suddenly have trouble consciously becoming aware of any of those feelings. And instead, you might feel a sense of pressure when you think of your attachment relationship, and all of those other feelings might suddenly feel inexplicably difficult for you to access sometimes for a very long period of time. Now, during periods of deactivation, so when something happens that triggers you into a deactivated state in your attachment system, you are more likely to see the relationship as a pressure and a burden and struggle to feel connected to anything that is positive within it or to your more intimate and vulnerable feelings towards your partner. And so it logically follows that you are most likely to exit a relationship at a point in which you are in a deactivated state. The problem is that unlike, let's say the dismissive avoidant who spends a great deal of their time in a deactivated state when it comes to their attachment relationships, you tend to ricochet back and forth between deactivation and activation. So you might leave a relationship and feel very calm about it, feel quite certain and settled that you made the right decision. Then as soon as you back away, the pressure gets taken off and you have some time to be alone and re-regulate yourself, your system is going to start coming back online. And all of those feelings that you felt towards your partner might suddenly arrive back to you very unexpectedly, sometimes months after you broke up with them. I like to liken this to the experience of standing too close to a bonfire. When you are really close to it, it starts to feel unbearably hot. And so what you naturally want to do is back away. And when you back away, you get that rush of cool air in and you feel an intense sense of relief and like you have done the right thing. But then you stand there for too long and you start to get cold again. And you start noticing that you want to move back in. And this is a very natural cycle that the fearful avoidant tends to go through when they are not aware of their own patterning. They get too close to the fire, they don't know how to set boundaries, ask for what they want, address the things that aren't working in a relationship in a consistent way. And so eventually it starts to feel like my only option is to back off, get out of the relationship. And as soon as that decision is made, it might feel like a relief, but then after some time, those warm memories start returning to you and you start realizing I'm kind of cold out here. And later on in this video, we're gonna talk about how to emotionally regulate your own temperature, so to speak, so that this cycle doesn't have to keep happening. Reason number four why people with fearful avoidant attachment styles can struggle with moving on from romantic relationships is that they tend to really struggle when it comes to working out who was responsible for what. So to have an insecure attachment style, whether that is avoidant, fearful avoidant or anxious means that you fairly consistently distort information and use a lot of storytelling to navigate your romantic relationships. So if you air more anxious, you tend to do a lot of idealizing of your partners, which can very quickly shift into you telling yourself a villain and victim story, particularly when your relationship ends. And if you're on the dismissive avoidant side of things, you're doing a lot of distorting of your emotional experience. When a relationship ends, you're more likely to reflect on, okay, what sequence of events happened here? What led to what? And how can I make sure in the future I'm not repeating the same type of pattern? And if you're secure, you integrate both how you felt about the relationship as well as what led to what within the relationship. So you can walk away with a balanced view of things. If you are fearful avoidant, you have access to both the distorted information of the anxious side of the attachment spectrum and the distorted emotional experience of being on the avoidant side of the attachment spectrum. However, you cannot access them both at once in an integrated way, ergo, you tend to find yourself ricocheting between the stories that you tell yourself about the relationship. So one day looking back on the relationship, you might be a little bit more in that anxious mindset. And you might go, well, I have pure intentions. I did everything for that other person. I gave and gave and gave, and they didn't give me enough back. Ergo, I was the victim in that situation. And it was the right choice to leave, though I should have given them more of a piece of my mind on the way out. And then the next day, you can wake up and look at things from the complete opposite perspective and go, wait a minute, I did X, Y, and Z, and that's what led to this. Ergo, the entire relationship and everything that went wrong within it was my fault. 
Now I just need to go back and make amends and apologize. And it can be this back and forth ricocheting that leaves you feeling absolutely helpless to figure out what happened. So you might have 10 different narratives about the relationship on 10 consecutive days because you aren't really grounded in your awareness of true information and true emotion like the secure person is. So this is kind of like, imagine you are trying to solve a crime and every day you get a piece of new evidence that directly contradicts the evidence you got the day before. You will be madly constantly reevaluating that case file and it will be very difficult to ever reach a conclusion until you learn somehow to integrate all of the pieces of evidence into a greater whole which is what happens when the fearful avoidance starts healing their attachment system. However, that takes quite a bit of time. And in the meantime, this sense of ricocheting back and forth between whose fault was what can be very preoccupying and very distressing for the fearful avoidant who either has recently left or is thinking about leaving their romantic relationship. It's like they don't have a consistent drawer they can put their emotions about that relationship in. So they're constantly opening drawers and trying to move it around and that gets really exhausting. And the fifth reason we're gonna talk about today why fearful avoidants tend to struggle to move on from romantic relationships is because they don't have a great deal of access to true pain. And this is actually true of all insecurely attached styles. What insecure attachment responses are, are a barrier between ourselves and the pain of loss. That is by definition what an insecure attachment response is. True emotional pain means having a true understanding of what happened and the ability to be present with our emotional response to what happened. True pain is the vehicle that moves us through loss. If we are distorting either the facts about what happened or our feelings about what happened, it is very difficult to access our true emotion about it. And in the case of the fearful avoidant, you are distorting both of those things as a product of your attachment style. Now, this was once very adaptive. When you were young, you needed all of those defenses to keep you away from the pain that would have been psychologically intolerable for you at that point in time. However, as an adult, it's often more adaptive to start to gain access to our true felt emotions. So we're gonna talk about what that looks like in the next portion of this video. In order to access your true emotional experience, you have to be oriented to reality and you have to be in touch enough with your body and emotional state to stay consistently aware of what you have lost and how you feel about it. The problem is that to be fearful avoidant means to be in a state of fairly consistent disorientation when your attachment system gets triggered. So you don't really know what way is up and what way is down when it comes to your emotional experience, which keeps you away from spending a lot of time in that place of deep grief and pain. Now, in the next part of this video, we're going to quickly go over and just give a little bit of a starting place or a jumping off point for where you can start to work on each of these problems in order to make the moving on process start to feel a little bit more natural for you. So problem number one, the problem of not having a lot of intimate connection. Now to work with this problem, we need to make the experience of ourselves being known feel less rare. Famous quote that's commonly attributed to Buddha, you only lose what you cling to. When we only invest ourselves really deeply and allow our vulnerabilities to be seen by a select few people, now we have a lot of pressure resting on each of those relationships. In order to relieve some of that pressure and not have to grip so tightly to those relationships, we have to allow ourselves the opportunity to be known deeply by more people. Obviously, if you are fearful avoidant, there are barriers in the way of this that are not there for, let's say, secure people. You are more likely to have a trauma history. You are more likely to struggle to share yourself openly. You are more likely to not know where to go to find people who are like you and could understand you. And so this is going to be a process that takes time patience and intention. It's probably going to involve a lot of shame work. So finding a way to convince yourself that it is okay to let yourself be seen by the right people under the right circumstances, and then developing the communication skills to share more about yourself in a contained way. So again, this is a very long process, but that's the first takeaway. In order to let go of that frantic sense of grasping towards the relationships that are deep and intimate, 
you need to work on building the skills to develop more of those relationships so that all of that pressure isn't resting on your relationship with your romantic partner alone. Problem number two, leaving while you are in love. We already kind of touched on this, but what you need to do here is develop an awareness of where you need to have boundaries while you are still in the relationship. So instead of letting anger or sadness or vulnerability pile up until you can't take it anymore and then just cutting ties with the entire relationship, you're gonna need to learn to slow down and address those problems one by one as they are happening. This means giving yourself permission to have boundaries. And that might be a really difficult thing for you to do if you come from a very enmeshed background. So you can justify this by telling yourself, these boundaries actually serve the health of the relationship. If I give myself permission to ask for space or whatever it is when I need it, I am giving my relationship a long-term fighting chance at success. So doing the painful and uncomfortable thing up front over and over again is going to give you the best possible chance at not getting overwhelmed and having to leave the relationship very abruptly while you are still in love with that person. And here's what's really cool about this. If you learn to communicate your needs and what isn't working for you in a clear, direct, and compassionate way, and your partner is consistently uninterested in working with you on that, it's likely that's going to change the way that you feel about your partner over time. So by exposing the issues in the relationship to oxygen, giving yourself and your partner the opportunity to address them head on and seeing what happens is going to give you a lot of information that your emotional system is now going to log. So if you do end up walking away from the relationship because you aren't able to draw boundaries or address issues as they come up, at least you can walk away not wondering, what if I had addressed those things? What if I had brought them up? What if I had made my needs clear? You know what happened and so you can walk away like a secure person at the point when your feelings have actually changed because you gave it a good honest shot and you saw what happened. Now this bleeds into the antidote for problem number three, which is that problem of leaving when you're in a deactivated state and then having your feelings return unexpectedly to you at a later point in time. Working with this requires developing an awareness of what happens that triggers you into a deactivated state. When you are feeling close, connected to, excited about your relationship with someone, and then all of a sudden it's like a flip switches and you can't find the part of yourself that liked or felt attracted to them, that does not happen out of nowhere. Your attachment patterning and your avoidant defenses are not random. Something happens that switches you into that mode. And if you can learn to trace your patterns backwards, Stop gaslighting yourself and just telling yourself, oh, I just have attachment issues and that's why all my relationships get ruined. That's not untrue in the sense of, yes, your attachment responses are coming online. However, they're not coming online out of nowhere. There is some inciting incident that is triggering you into deactivation. If you can figure out what that is, put down any judgments you have around the fact that you had that response as a consequence of whatever happened, and actually figure out what you needed in that moment that you didn't have that triggered you into deactivation, you can start addressing those moments as they come up in the relationship and showing up for yourself and asking for what you need in order to lessen the likelihood that you're going to become overwhelmed altogether and start feeling as though the relationship overall is not something that you want. So very often what happens here, and I will have a video coming out in the next month that addresses this more specifically, is there will be a sense of disgust that comes online. It can feel like I want no part of this relationship whatsoever, I feel 100% sure of it, and all of a sudden, the strong feelings that you previously had seem to have evaporated. Now, if you can start to look at your own disgust response as your body saying, there is something here that I am telling you no to. Take that seriously, ask yourself, what is wrong in this moment in my relationship that is giving me this feeling of disgust and how can I address it in a way that is respectful of both myself and the other? So this means reeling ourselves back in from the projections. It's not, you are disgusting. It's, hey, I'm noticing I'm having some sort of negative response to something that's happening right now. What do I need? 
The more you can start to notice and ask yourself that question, the more you can start to learn where you need to make your needs known within a relationship. And the more you're able to make your needs known within a relationship and draw boundaries around what's important to you, the less likely you are to deactivate and find yourself exiting the relationship when you are in a deactivated state. Number four, the problem of struggling to work out who is responsible for what in a relationship. Often, if you are starting out with a fearful avoidant attachment system to help you get oriented within all of these stories and figure out where the truth lies, it's gonna be really helpful to have what Alice Miller calls an enlightened witness. So someone like a therapist who is trained in attachment theory, a support group that is based around attachment theory, that has an understanding of the ways in which you might be distorting information and can help you find common ground when you're going really far in one direction or the other with your attachment responses. So having some sort of professional or peer group or even a close friend who's well-versed in this stuff and knows you well, who can remind you of who you are when you are really lost in one response or the other, can go a really long way to helping you orient yourself in a coherent and consistent narrative about your attachment relationships. And once you have a true, coherent, and consistent narrative about your attachment relationships that integrates both what actually happened and what true undistorted emotions you had about it, you are well on your way to earning security. Which brings us to the last point. In order to learn to access that true pain that you have so much trouble finding within yourself, you're probably going to need to go on a bit of an attachment healing journey. The journey to tolerating true emotional pain in the moment that it's happening and being able to carry yourself through that pain without offloading it onto other people or letting it fester endlessly inside of yourself, that is the journey to secure attachment. And it does not happen overnight. It happens in thousands of individual moments where you commit to staying present with what's happening instead of running away with some story about what's happening, and you learn to tend to your own emotions with respect to other people's. This is a long process, however, it only gets better the longer you walk down that path. And at the end of that path is the place of secure attachment where yes, breakups still hurt, but it is a clean pain because you understand what happened, you understand what you need to heal from it, and you move forward in a much more linear direction. And if you're starting from a place of fearful avoidant, this might feel so out of reach, but I promise you that with time and intention and the willingness to be very honest with yourself, it can get unbelievably better. One of my favorite quotes by Carl Jung, all neuroses is a substitute for legitimate suffering. And so while this might not sound that cheery, what this process is, is the process of replacing neurotic patterns of thought and behavior that we can get stuck in and circle around in for ages with the experience of being present with our true suffering. Once we know how to do that, we can get over it and actually move on. All right, that's all I have to say for today on the topic of fearful avoidance and the struggle to move past romantic relationships as always, let me know what you guys are thinking, feeling, experiencing as you watch this. I love you all. I hope you're taking care of yourselves and each other and your inner children, and I will see you back here again super soon.